which ones. I was born during World War II. So, uh, it, that was a tremendously disruptive time. So I was born into disruptive times. And I'm 76 years old. And my entire childhood was a dis disruptive time because I was brought up in a native value system and educated in a non-native value system. So I couldn't get a whole lot more disruptive than that to my spirit or to my way of seeing the world. And... Uh, it was a real struggle to try and put all that together. Then there was Vietnam, and I was in the service, and I was over in that vicinity for two years in the 60s, and that was a tremendous disruption to my, another layer of disruption to my moral codes. And then I came back, uh, I, you know, I say moral codes because 23 veterans a day today commit suicide. And a lot of that is the moral wounds, what the VA calls the moral wounds that they suffer from. They sign up for the right reasons. They go in. They're put in situations where they see things that shouldn't happen. And uh, they run counter to their fundamental values, and they don't know how to re-enter and come back into civil society, and I'm putting quotes on that, so it all starts to unravel for them. That's a lot of people, 23 per day, okay? Then uh, that's, that's right now. The river, that I grew up on, my grandfather and I watched die. We watched their, it go from being gazillions of birds flying across the sun to being, now I'm really happy if I see two pair of red-winged blackbirds out here, or woodpeckers, you know, I'm happy if I see two pair, you know? And so it's always been a disruptive time as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, after I got out of law well, when I was in college in the late 60s, it was, the big, it was the civil rights movement and everything was coming apart and the police were chasing us out of the schools and San Francisco State and beating students with wooden samurai swords called Boken that they were still able to carry uh, because people were saying no. So that was an extremely disruptive time. Uh, also, uh, then I went to work on a ranch up in the foothills of the Sierras that had a lot of young people that were this chewed up by society, spit out by probation departments into this school. A lot of Native kids, a lot of non-Native kids that were on horrendous edges in themselves, doing every kind of drug they could and just trying to hang on to life by their fingernails. That's another manifestation of the disruptive time that a lot of people now are calling colonialism. Then I went to Guatemala in the 1970s, lived and worked down there. And in the 19, early 1980s, under the Reagan administration's watch, uh, 85,000 Mayans were killed in about 20 months, straight up genocide. So that was from 82, 83. When I look back on it now, at my age, and with the education that I've been able to get and give myself, uh, going deeper into my traditions and 
reading the history and looking at it all, listening to the old people tell the stories of their lives and listening to a woman in my class last year talk about how she was forcibly sterilized without her consent uh, by the by the Indian Health Service in the 1970s, okay? Putting all that together with talking with my California Indian friends who say there were 50 tribes here in the San Francisco Bay Area, 50 plus or four today, the rest disappeared. And all this happened right coming up to the edge of the 20th century. So between 1848 and the late 1870s, there was a 90% population reduction of California Indians. That's what I would call a disruptive time for indigenous people. And nobody knows this stuff except Indians. And that's a major disruption. <laughs> so to me, these disruptive times are more of the same. Uh, when you have uh, 60 million buffalo killed in 60 years, uh, 40 million killed in one 12-year period in order to starve the Plains people into submission uh, in the 1800s, that's the same kind of thing. So the destruction people now are saying is the end of life as we know it. And this, I say, well, Talk to a native person, talk to an indigenous person if you want to know what that's like, because that's what we've been dealing with. People talk about transgenerational trauma. That trauma is a murder. That trauma, even when it's not murder, you're talking about 95 to 98% population reduction since the colonists first came here. A whole lot of that, we don't even know the real numbers, a whole lot of that happened after the United States was formed. That's when the genocidal policies started coming down, you know. And uh, so to me, I look at the coronavirus, I look at climate, what they call climate change and all, and it's simply more of the same. And not to diminish it, really, I don't mean to diminish it whatsoever, but to say that it's, it's not an anomaly, it's not something that's come upon us suddenly, it's a logical progression. Native people from as far back as I can remember, I've been warning about this. We go back to the 60s and 70s, 1960s, 1970s, uh, which is not that long ago. You have in some ways, but in some ways, it's really a long time ago in terms of how so many people are seeing this as a sudden occurrence, okay? It's disrupting lives that were kind of cruising along thinking as General Electric put it in the 1950s on all their ads, progress is our most important product. There it is right there. Progress is our most important product. Perpetual expansion in a finite space. What's wrong with that picture? You know, it doesn't work logically. There's got to be a gift somewhere. So for, for indigenous people, that give has been happening for a very, very long time. And the adjustment process has been also happening for a very, very long time. So it's only a catastrophic situation, as far as I'm concerned, for people who've not really been paying attention to what the colonial experience has been for the native people of these lands. And the shock of this now, I, I see lots of evidence of, of you know, living in denial is not a healthy place to live. You know, we wonder why we have all these shooters and all this, this stuff that we have. 
and there's something there's some there's a void that's created by what's been going on you know uh, there are native people in the late 1800s i mean as far back as you go you can find people saying you can't relate to the planet this way you can't relate to mother earth this way you can't you just can't it's going to come back on you uh, it's going to come back on all of us and that's what's happening now i was talking with a doctor the other day about it and we were talking about the plague you know that, that wiped out what, a third of europe and they discovered, after looking at it in hindsight, said, well, they were living in filth. And that's what created it. You know, the idea back then of, of sewage, the sewer system, was to throw the bucket out in the morning. That's why they wore those big hats and big boots and stuff like that, because they were walking around and they're awful. And, uh, of course, the rats and all that, uh, that live in that kind of environment. That's what the plague came from. And this doctor and I were talking about how we're still uh, living in filth, but the filth is real shiny and pretty, so we don't see it as filth. And this is the chemicals in, in the in the earth, the chemicals then that go into the body, immune systems get lowered. There's, I don't know the mechanics of the coronavirus, but I do know the mechanics of where the desecration of the earth has desecrated my own body. Growing up on a river that's full of mercury that was, that was brought out through the 19th century gold mine. So, you know, my, my heart has suffered, literally suffered, the results of mercury going into my system from that. And uh, there's only so much you could do to detox from that. But there's countless people the, along the rivers in the Sierra Nevada that suffered today from the gold mining in the 19th century. And that's on a physical level. Then all the people that suffer on a uh, what you might call a metaphysical level or in a, more accurately an emotional level for what's happened to their communities. It's, it's intense. I guess all this is to say we, we need to embark upon a, a serious cleanup campaign. And the cleanup cam campaign needs to be physical, it needs to be metaphysical, it needs to be emotional. It needs to be educational, it needs to be intellectual, it needs to be all across the boards. And we have to come to the will uh, to do that. So we have to see that uh, it's not a viable alternative to jump in your Tesla and drive to Mars, okay? That this is what we have. You know, one of my elders, Dr. Darrell Wilson, who's walked on now, I used to say, great wonder, you know, great mystery. We are your children. And, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, well, the earth will be better off without us. It's kind of like saying, you know, the mom's going to be better off without her kids. It's a little bit twisted. But that whole twisting of reality is what, what we're suffering from. Well, I think there are aspects of it that are really good because uh, we're all human beings that are of Earth. And I think that, uh, well, the, in one way, the, the, the kind of dualism that's created between white and Indians is a bit unreal. Uh, at the same time that it is very, very real, unfortunately. There are very unfortunate parts about that. But I think there's a memory in all of us of our proper place uh, 
with earth and with each other and with the creatures of earth. There's a memory of that. And I think the interest in uh, indigenous people, specifically here in the United States, I can speak to it here because that's where I'm from, because I think we've been the most recently despoiled. Yeah. Uh, colonization here is extremely recent. If you look at California, that decimation I was talking about earlier, 90% population reduction in like 30 years, that's one generation. That's right before the 20th century. That's shortly before the rise of the Nazis. And a lot of that stuff, the boarding schools and all that, where they were killing the Indian to save the man, forcing people into boarding schools, children, five-year-old kids into boarding schools. What's happening? Well, the whole Hitler machine was, was getting going and underway. That was all happening, all right? So that, that belief that one's cultural vision uh, should be foisted on somebody else at you know, whatever cost. That I, I think there's a lot of theft of of projections of what people think vision quests are, of what uh, people think indigenous thought is. Uh, for all the traditional people I know, if there's money involved, it's not real. Okay, so you can kind of put that on a shelf right there and say, well, if somebody's being paid to conduct a, a ceremony, whether it be a sweat lodge or a vision quest or anything, then it's not native, okay? Then it's an appropriation or it's an idea of what, that's about. Um, I see that happening everywhere. I see people wanting indigenous knowledge without having a clue of what it really is or means. You know, they really don't. You know, it's. I think it's a projection of of their notion of sustainability and reciprocity. Okay, but it's still it's still a Western projection. It's still a colonial projection. So one has to be really careful in moving into these spaces to be respectful, you know, um, or to not be taken advantage of, or to not think one is getting something that really isn't what it's about. I think the indigenous wisdom that people really need is whatever native people have been able to come to in themselves in terms of courage and in terms of adaptability to manage genocide to manage to still be here after a 90% population reduction, talking here in California, a 95 to 98% population reduction we're talking about across all of Turtle Island. That's the wisdom that's needed, not something that's projected of what happened or of what was going on pre-contact. I don't think people have the education to have a clue of what was really going on here pre-contact. I really don't. I think it's an imagined thing. Uh, so I think that's highly problematical. Um, I went to a, a uh, presentation on the new economy last year, and all three people had on their slide presentation returned to indigenous wisdom. And there was a young Native woman there who was crying because she felt invisible at that university. And everybody got up and walked away from her. You know, they couldn't deal with her tears, with her sorrow. But indigenous wisdom was up on the PowerPoints. 
And so finally I asked, they said, any question? I said, yeah, what is indigenous wisdom? They had no answer. And so I said, well, for 30 years, I've been teaching uh, Native American literature at a local college. I poll my students when they come in uh, every semester. Maybe one or two has ever read a Native author. Okay? But or is this the same situation with these presenters? I suspect so. I suspect they don't know what they're talking about, honestly. I said, so how, how, if you cannot tell me what indigenous wisdom is right here, right now, you can't answer that. Why do you have it on your PowerPoint? And if I have 28, 30 people coming into my class for 30 years who's only ever read one native writer, or maybe two, right? And that's only maybe two or three students out of 30. How is this society really gonna understand what native society has gone through and continues to go through and yet it wants the wisdom? This is it's a fantasy. I think we have to understand the nature of the genocide here. We have to understand the nature of the destruction. We have to uh, have a, what Kyle, Dr. Kyle White talks about, is a Potawatomi scholar, talks about it, looking at how kinship relations have been broken and how we can revive kinship relations. And that's a long-term project. I think with what I see the danger with indigenous wisdom is people want to fix now. That's colonial thought. It's not much different than wanting the gold or wanting this or wanting that piece of land or, or something else. There's a grasping. Okay, I can take this now because it's my right to take it. You know, it's kind of a form of manifest destiny in a sense. But it's not really doing the hard work, you know. It's, it's in 1900, they said on the floor of Congress, when people came, uh, the energy companies came around to the reservations and they said, we want to mine. And all of them said, no, it's not the right way to, reach, to relate to the mother. And so on the floor of Congress, this is a direct quote, we must destroy the sense of community, build a sense of the individual and foster a good Protestant work ethic, okay? Then they went in and reformed all the reservation governments and took all the traditional forms out and put in tribal councils that were staffed largely by men who had been through the boarding schools, who'd had their culture stripped away from them. You know, this is not the case in every single reservation, but this happened a lot. And so then people felt the corruption. So you had that whole divide people from their cultural values, and then you can take what you want from them. Uh, what Dr. White is talking about is a long-term project, okay? And education has got to be a huge part of that, you know? Uh, little children need to know that Native people are still here. They need to know what has exactly happened. As we come up in the educational system, we have to do the hard analysis of going, what is all this destruction about? We can't envision a better future. It's like imagining to fix a motor without taking the motor apart to see what's wrong with the internal workings of it. You know, it's that simple, you know, but we're not willing to do that because we don't want to deal with the pain. Because where we identify culturally as colonial people or within that binary of white, where, you know, somebody might say, well, I'm white, then we have to deal with the guilt. We have to deal with the pain. We have to deal with the emotional suffering. Well, and I'm saying, well, Native people have been dealing with this guilt and pain and emotional suffering for generations upon generations. 
Look up transgenerational trauma. White people also have that transgenerational trauma, but it's in a completely different form. And they have the, the hegemonic position of power in society to where they don't have to look at it if they don't want to. And I hear it over and over. Well, I don't want to deal with the guilt. I don't want to deal with the pain. I don't want to deal with the sorrow. And I don't have any patience with that. I'm saying, well, you, you don't want to deal with a whole huge set of tools that we have as human beings, all right? Guilt is a sign that we did something wrong. That's what it is, okay? So if you identify as white, then you have the opportunity there to learn something culturally about your your, your cultural identification about yourself, about where your cultural identification influences the way you think, where it creates how you approach the world, you can look at that if you're willing to deal with that. And then within that, you can say, okay, this is where my culture influences me. And of course, a lot of people pretend that, that white American Society is not a culture, but it is a culture. Okay, America, it's a culture. Uh, so you have to be able to step back and say, okay, here's where my cultural framework defines how I perceive the world, and here's where I am in here. We do an exercise in my class where I have my students in the critical thinking class define American cultural values. And they put up things like exploitation, objectification of women, competition, uh, individualism. They put a whole list of things up without any feedback from me. Then I have them put on the board, what are your personal values? They put honor, loyalty, you know, honesty, uh, compassion, things like that, all right? They're completely the opposite of how they define their cultural values. Well, that's the phenomenon of the colonial society that we live in. And so the colonial machine is going forward and it's eating up the values, of the, the beautiful values inside of individuals, all right? This happens, this is what assimilation has attempted to do with native people and it's worked with a lot of native people, it divides us. Uh, inside ourselves and with ourselves, and it's doing the same thing with non-native people. It's dividing our, us from what we really know is right. And the sorrow, the sorrow has to be dealt with. The pain has to be dealt with. If, if Germans did not deal with the guilt and the sorrow and the pain, then they would not be teaching the Holocaust in their schools like they do, all right? They say, you didn't cause this, but you have to understand this so it doesn't happen again and that it doesn't happen in other forms. We're not even close to that, okay? So people are still saying, well, I, I don't want to deal with the pain. I just want the native view. I just want that perspective for myself because that heals me. Well, you're still alienated from understanding that your culture is continuing the machine of destruction. So the commitment has to be long-term and has to be starting when they're this big, all right? And coming up to know Okay, that little girl over there, she's not Mexican. She's an old lone. She's a California Indian. Her parents told her she was Mexican to protect her because her grandparents told them if people come into the town and say, who's Indian here? You say you're Mexican because that way you can stay alive. People need to understand that that is a Native reality. They need to get that, but nobody has that education. You talk about the sterilizations of the 70s. Hardly anybody knows about that stuff. 
I have tons of people that don't have any clue about the boarding school, what was really going on there, and who formed them, and why they formed them, and how that fit into resource extraction and everything else. I've heard people say, well, their intentions were good. Really? I've heard people say, well, we can't judge the actions of history from the morals of the present. We don't have any trouble doing that with Nazis. We don't have any trouble doing that uh, with the bad guys in Shakespeare, right? Moral behavior and immoral behavior are pretty darn clear historically all through literature. We can look at Faust and we can say, well, what did Faust do that was wrong? You know, he made a deal with the devil. <laughs> and, and Thomas Mann's Faust is... He was going to fool the devil by doing good work, okay, by selling his soul to the devil. But it doesn't work that way. As soon as you sell your soul to the devil, you've sold your soul to the devil. You cannot catch up and have your God, your creator, redeem you. It's a daily process. It's a really a daily process. We have to understand how we got here. It's that basic. You know, and if we feel the right that we don't need to understand that we got here, I don't even, calling that a position of privilege is even too light. It's arrogant, really. It's dismissive. And I think, too, this is where, you know, my friend who says they hate us, don't they, is really right. Because if you are not willing to look into what your civilization has wrought on the very people who've been here for tens upon tens upon tens upon thousands of years, then you're dismissing them as people. And dismissing someone is kind of the ultimate act of hatred, in a sense, not really. You don't even care enough about them, you know, to give them the time of day. That's really a deep insult. And I, the way I look at that is that's a kind of an act of desecration in a sense. You're desacredizing a whole lot of people because their existence, as John Trudell put, puts it, were the evidence of the crime, okay? And so that's why we're still invisible, because people don't want to look at that crime and take, you know, take advantage of learning what they can from it. So when that happens, that desecration or that lack of compassion for the other person means then that the person who is dismissing, whether it be subconscious or cultural influence or whatever, is taking on that lack of compassion as part of the way they move through the world. So if you if you have a lack of compassion for that person there, if you dismiss that person there, you're having a lack of compassion that you're now carrying. So that lack of compassion is for yourself. It's for a part of yourself as well. So you're dismissing a whole part of yourself as well. So then we create, we become partial people moving through the world. And partial people are always grasping for something to make themselves whole. And so then the idea becomes, well, I need to make myself whole, so I'm going to go and I'm going to take this and I'm going to take this and I'm going to take this because it suits me without really considering, well, how is that seen by the people from whom you're taking it? How is that felt by the land from which you are taking it? Or the animals, or the sky? You know, that kinship is not there because then it becomes about me. It becomes about the self. And that fits into the whole kind of dynamic. Well, you have to make yourself, you have to love yourself first. Or you have to make yourself whole before you can help other people. Well, why is that? You know, that's part of the Western 
modality of self first, why can't a person learn to love through loving the other? Right? Because the other is the self. Right? We mirror each other. We are completely connected. The, the the whole thing of all my relations are with all things I'm related to you, is not a concept. It's it's a reality, okay. And so it's not something. It's not a a conceptual framework to go for or to try to get or to obtain or then to hold and carry. But it's a reality to perceive. So it's a relationship to be in, it's a constant relationship that's there. It's a living, vibrant thing. It's not an idea. And this is kind of a big conflict, I think, between, uh, I use Western just for lack of a better word, but colonial is maybe better within the framework of the United States, uh, the colonial mentality is based on a real fundamental desire to take and a fundamental right to take. However, that was generated. That's a whole, perhaps a whole other discussion, but maybe not. Maybe it's part of the discussion. You know, we have to understand the antecedents, okay? So we have to look at what happened. If we're talking specifically about colonialism here in the United States, we have to look at what happened to the Europeans that came here in order to understand that rapaciousness and that hunger and that drive and that self-righteousness and the fear. I think that the people who came here in a certain way to begin with, many were really fascinated with the freedom that Native people have. And if you go back and you read the, you read a lot of the early settlers, they talk about this. There's no one more free on the face of the earth than the red man. He goes where he wants to go. This is a quote from like 1600s. He goes where he wants to go and does what he wants to do because he knows that he always has the support of his community because he is always supporting them. So this whole idea of obligations in the community and personal autonomy that you are you are an autonomous individual within a universe of of unit or a large community of member being, all right. That is a different way of living than to be free as an individual to do whatever the heck you want to do. Okay, so that's an, another thing that needs to be really studied. You know, kids need to talk about this stuff and find out what it means to be part of a class, to know that, you know, you have an obligation when you come into a classroom to serve that classroom, okay? We think in terms of human rights, as a friend of mine, Greg Castro, a Salinan loading leader, uh, great, great person, talks about this, he said, you know, California, his, his nation is born into and trained into a sense of obligation, human obligation, not human rights, all right? That we're the last ones created here, he talks about. So we have an obligation to serve all those people that created such a beautiful place for us to be. Uh, Daryl Wilson talks about people have to obey the great law of respect for all living things. And it's very uh, large uh, explication of what that means. But he says, so that the sweetness of life can continue. Now the implication is that life is sweet. It's not something we have to make as sweet, okay? So the, it was something we have to perceive as sweet. That's a fundamental difference, right? You know, they, it's difficult for many of them, the non-native students, to deal with the cultural guilt, but 
when they keep reading the native writers, they realize that all the native writers are speaking for the benefit of everyone. This is why it's really important to listen to native writers. There are really many good non-native writers that write about native ideas and issues and cultures, but immersion in the native voice is absolutely crucial to understand the intentions of native narratives, native stories, so to speak, uh, especially stories that deal with the history of this apocalypse that we're enduring now and that we're attempting to find survivance in. Not survival, but survivance, which is a, 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 a notion of survival, but with cultural dignity. It's not mere survival. This is coined by an Anishinaabe scholar named Carol Visitor. It's a really important notion because it's not just making do and surviving within this destructive kind of atmosphere that we're caught in, but it's, it's the notion of rebuilding and regenerating and uh, giving respect to the ancestors, honoring the ancestors who've gone through so much and, and still go through so much if we feel them knowing if, what the future was bringing. It's like knowing that many of the people that, that we include in our prayers as ancestors, say if we start in the late 1800s, more of, they knew far more people who were dead than they knew who were alive. And so they're, they're looking at the future. They're holding on to these traditions. They're hiding away in the woods and teaching kids ceremonies, and they're doing what they can to keep living, knowing what the future was going to be because they could see this, this huge movement, okay, apocalyptic movement, if you will, of such a drastic change. So when I open my classes with prayers and thank the ancestors, I'm thanking them for dealing with far more pain than a non-Indian has to deal with today in order to, to come to some kind of terms with what colonial society has done and continues to do in different shapes. That's why I say deal with it. <laughs> deal with it. It's a healthy thing. So these students, they deal with it because they hear the intentions. They feel the intentions through immersion in the native voice. And they feel the pain and the experience of the native experience. They feel the also the courage. They feel the love. And so they come through even in a three, four month period, which is what the classes are, that four months of immersion, I'll give you an example. I always ask my students, what did you learn this semester? There was a woman sitting in the back. She raised her hand. She said, I learned something very important. I said, what's that? She said, I learned why so many of my friends do hard drugs. Okay, Because she got the whole picture. She got the big picture. She was able to go back, right? and look at the history of her family here and place it within this larger context. So then, she, and she has all these friends that are doing hard drugs and nobody knows why. So this education helps her understand that. So it's a really liberating education in a sense, you know. Um, it's not that she's learning native ways, she's learning the native experience. That's really important. In that she begins to inhabit her own deeper ways in a whole other way. So she comes out autonomous. 
right? She comes out a wiser person, understanding what her friends are doing. And so I said, well, what are you going to do with that? And she goes, now I know how to help them. Okay? I know where to start. With uh, young Native people uh, who do this reading, it gives them understandings. They're different depending upon their tribal affiliations, their family histories. It's all completely different, just like with everybody else. But uh, recently, a young woman told me that reading one book, the first book of the semester, made her realize, and it was written by a man that's nearby the reservation she grew up on, and uh, not the same uh, California Native Nation, two different nations, but not far apart. And it made her realize from a line, and he, he wrote, it said, I come from great people. And it made her realize, she said, that she too comes from great people and that she is a great person. And it helped her to deal with all, she says, that it helps her to deal with the erasure that is put on her by the American educational system. She doesn't exist. She can learn about Martin Luther King and, you know, Cesar Chavez and stuff like that, but Wilma Mankiller's not in there and none of her people are in there, you know. She's absent from the curriculum. And so she's absent as a person from the society. That does things to kids. We still have the Washington R Word football team. All right, we have all of that. And very often when I say the R word, people go, what? And I go, well, it's the N word. We don't have the New Jersey N word, but we have the Washington R word and people hardly give it a second thought. So people are beginning to talk about that a little bit, but beginning to talk about it really should be evidence of how much has not been talked about for so darn long, and that has powerful effects on Native children. It really does. It has powerful effect on every Native person, whether they admit it or not, from my standpoint, because it's okay for a racial slur to be thrown about all the time, all the time, by people who are not of your cultural background. So when I'm to answer your question, I was thinking about it last night actually because more and more, I think the last 30 years of my teaching have created a doubtless body of evidence that immersion into the indigenous story is a healing process for absolutely everyone involved. And it's not something that cures what happens because that can't be cured. And there's a big difference between a cure and a healing. And I think the, the cultural modality that wants the cure, that wants it all to be over and gone, but it can't be over and gone. A society that commits genocide, that deals with this level of destruction, always has to come to terms with that, from now until forever. That always has to be part of the curriculum, all right? Because it's something that is a potential within the human spirit. This is not to say that uh, rapaciousness and all that is uh, simply being human at all. But that potential is always there. And unless we understand the consequences of those, that potential and see the consequences of that, then we might just try it on out of ignorance, right? Or out of like a, um, a momentum, a cultural momentum, right? So I heard a German guy talking recently, young professor, 
said, yeah, there are a few people that say we, we're, we've already studied the Holocaust, that Holocaust enough, we don't need to study it anymore. And he really articulated it beautifully. He said, a society, the German society created that, and we will always have to be in relationship to that. If we forget about that, then that potential can rise again. So, you know, it's not like indigenous people didn't screw up, you know? It's not like that at all. But I think we have more of a tendency to remember those screw ups and they're in the stories where people went to the wrong kind of power, okay? And so they saw that they had to restructure everything because that kind of power was wrong. It doesn't work in the long term. Um, we're still caught, I think, in a very, very brief, uh, comparatively brief uh, psychology, if you want to call it that. And uh, I, I see it as a, as a form of psychosis, really, that uh, is anti-life. It's an obsession with death. And it's ironically, a part of a fear of death as a part of life. It's a fear of pain. It's a fear of all that. So we're, you know, society's doing everything it can to avoid that to the point where it just creates it everywhere. It's, it's a very weird kind of thing. But I think when we list, look at the history of humankind, it's a very short period where we're caught in this, this, this rapacious thing. Colonialism is a good word for it. But the problem is we're educating our children through our actions and through our lack of reflection in the schools and the media and the society. The lack of reflection is making us believe that what's going on now is human nature. Okay? That's a huge mistake. You know? That's like, you know, why should we, why should we believe a definition of human nature given to us by a system with this kind of record of rapaciousness. It, it doesn't make any kind of sense from a critical thinking standpoint, and yet that's what we're doing. And we take that into ourselves. We can see that it's a potential without it being an inevitability. That's what we have to do. You know, because then we have to see when that rises up that we have to make active choices about who we're going to be and how we're going to relate to things. Okay, and seeing our mistakes, you know, somebody told me a little while back, said, oh, you have such a great wisdom. I said, well, you know what the history of the word wisdom is, don't you? I said, they said no, what? And I said, well, was dumb. If you was dumb enough times and you admit it to yourself, then you get what people call wisdom and it slurs down into wisdom, all right? But... It really is admitting where you messed up, you really. And, you know, a German psychiatrist told me that an incredible number of his patients are having to deal with the, the, the trauma of the Holocaust there. And they're young people. They weren't even alive when that was happening. But they have to deal with it. And he said what he has to do is go through like 150 years of German culture that led up to that Holocaust, family patterns, all that. And of course, this is, this is what they're doing is they're proving what indigenous science has been carrying all along. Of course, it's blood memory, you know, that's a, one way of calling it, you know. It's, it's, it's all there. It's all there. I kind of think that freedom, that real freedom or, and autonomy, I like that word better than freedom, comes with carrying all of that with you all the time. 
that there is no release. I'm not one that really believes in forgiveness. I don't like the idea of it as it's as it's presented. I once saw a definition of it that it came up about the same time the Roman church was going through Europe and decimating all the earth-based gynocentric societies and that it comes from the word forget. Okay, so it kind of uh, has that quality for me that's problematical. Uh, and as a veteran uh, and as an aided person, I don't want to forget anything that I've seen. I don't want to be forgiven for any of the terrible things that I've done in my life because I don't want to be free of them. I want to be able to carry them responsibly so that I don't do them again, all right? So that I, I know viscerally what that's about, okay? So I think there's a whole, there's this whole other mood that I kind of have problems with, whether they're native people or non-native people, of forgive and forget and freedom, be free of that pain and stuff. I And I think of Greg Castro's notion of obligation. So, uh, for instance, when I was in the service, some of my fellow service men murdered uh, an old man who was one of our allies. And people have said, well, you just need to let that go, you know, and, you know, you need to forgive the whole situation and everything. And I've, I've found that when I do try to let that go, it makes me, or when I have in my life, which was when I was much younger, that it made me only part of who I am. Because that was such a powerful event. That was the initial moral wound, all right? To see that my fellow soldiers would do something like this and that I couldn't stop it. And this was a fine, fine man who really helped us in a lot of ways and helped me personally very deeply. That forgetting him was, or attempting to forget that was really dishonoring what happened. It was dishonoring his death. And so now I, I carry it with me with a, a sense of responsibility to him. And that's how I see understanding the genocide here. So I see understanding my grandfather's pain and, and, and the pain of all the families of all the Native people, uh, the young Native people that I work with. I want to remember all that. Because if I do not remember it, then I'm separating myself off and that becomes another act of privilege. And to me, it's, I'm not anti-Christian, but to me, forgiveness is not part of my, it's not part of my lexicon, so to speak. And I think it's that it gets too close to that. Well, that was then, this is now. Let's forget this and move on, okay? Why can't they just forget about that? They have their casinos now and, you know, and they, this and that and the other, you know, it's, no. The trauma is still here. It's still doing damage because people want the Indians to forget and forget. It, it's too much part of the, the, the notion of lineal time, okay? And it's an imposition of lineal time. It says, okay, if this all this happened, I come up to this point, now I don't want to deal with this pain anymore because it's too much weight for me to carry. And so I'm going to forgive myself. I'm going to forgive my ancestors. I'm going to forgive my culture so that I can move on freely, okay? Well, that's not the way time works, okay? Time is, a, is you mentioned earlier, you know, epigenetics. 
cosmic web theory says that all things are created or all things are connected across space and time, which is really what, you know, all my relations talks about in a certain way too. So, and it's what I was trying to say in going to water and Leslie Silco talks about this too, you know, time is like an ocean. Right, and everything's touching each other all the time. So when we try to move on into another space, we're isolating ourselves, ironically or paradoxically, because we're saying, well, that now, I'm free of all that. Okay. Well, where does it go? You know, is there some cosmic trash button that you can hit? Where does it go? And then if you do that, then how then do you relate to someone who hasn't, who, is, who hasn't let that go, who is still dealing with that? Do you then try and put your modality of forgiving and forgetting on them if those two things are together? I see a lot of this in, in the uh, uh, native and non-native relationships. You know, I think where there are, is forgiveness that works for me, it's like when the vets who were um, at Standing Rock asked for forgiveness of the Dakota people for what the 7th Cavalry did at Wounded Knee and the uh, elders forgave them. I think that's a kind of forgiveness that's that worked for those people. You know, I wasn't there, but I only looked at it from the outside, from the pictures, and read some of what people said. Because there's a, 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 a real complete accountability, and there's not a forgetting. It's more like a remembering, and they're in it together now. So. It's an acknowledgement between all of them that it was not okay. Uh, so, and I would suspect that those vets are in a process of remembering. And I think it was the vets that were able to do that because they're vets, because they understand what they have to carry, right? And they probably understand that none of what they have gone through will ever go away. There's no place for it to go. It's going to be in their bodies and their minds and their hearts their entire lives. Okay. And I know that as a vet. And I know that from my friends who are vets. And I take that as a metaphor, I think, in a sense, in a really real sense, very real sense, that what we've undergone here is is a horrendous war. And Daryl Wilson talked about it as a war of the thinking, and that war is still going on. And the consequences of that war have been, the physical consequences have been horrendous for Native people. And so we're veterans of that. And on the other side of it, you know, the, the colonial perpetrators are also veterans of that war. So they have to learn inside of themselves what they're carrying that's making them continue to deny life and to, to perpetuate the same kind of behavior that, that created that war. Again, you have to come back and really do the deeper analysis to just say, well, okay, how do we move on? Let's move on. You got to really get in and understand it. You got to study the battles. You got to study the motivations. You got to really, really get in and look at it, I think. I don't see any other way to come back to right relationship because... All of this is about falling out of kinship, falling out of right relationship, right? And I think it's going to take time. It's going to take the will to do it. I'm not sure if, uh, if people have the will to do it, okay? 
I know most of the native kids that I have in my classrooms don't have a choice. Okay. And that's again a place where there's a kind of a rough emotional edge uh, where people can say, well, I don't want to deal with that. Well, there's a whole block of people that don't have a choice. And if they say, I don't want to deal with it, then that makes it even worse for them. So they have to find ways to deal for them. And everybody's timing is different. It's not like you can just throw everybody into the pool and just go, Phoonk! right? Because somebody might be so traumatized by one thing or another, or is so unready that they can't deal with it, you know, native or not native. It's all, you know, everybody has a different kind of cycle in their life. That's why it has to be a pervasive thing. That's why it has to be in the educational system. It has to be dealt with in the media. You know, it has to be dealt with uh, in what you're doing with this film. People need to really think about this, about the necessity to really, really understand the depth of what's going on here as a result of what has gone on and what will continue to go on until we come to terms with it. I think, uh, again, the rapaciousness and the, uh, the violence toward Earth, uh, the attitude that that it's okay to just take everything and to take from others. And I, th I think that's cultural far more than it is human. But like I was saying before, we've been immersed in that cultural modality long enough to where it's termed the human experience. If we look at, say, 60,000 years ago, uh, Australian Aboriginal people who were baking cake. The, they were living in such a way where there's no archeological evidence of any major conflagration for tens of thousands of years. An archeologist, anthropologist told me there's no archeological evidence of any major conflagration here on Turtle Island for a minimum of 10,000 years. Native people will tell you it goes from, from the dawn of time. So it's not that they were perfect at all. It's not that they were without violence at all. Um, but in terms of genocidal uh, confrontations, there's no real evidence of that. There's speculation on the part of Western people and some Native people say, well, you know, they were responsible for the decimation of the megafauna and stuff like that. And they weren't all ecologists and so on and so forth. And those things are true to a degree, but in a larger scope of looking at human behavior, uh, which is a uh, really an outgrowth of human motivation, and human uh, understanding of humans' place uh, with life itself and with Earth, um, I think that the human experience is far more uh, benign if we look at the evidence and, and far more uh, interactive with the planet in a positive way than, uh, than not. And I think the, the decimations that we see through colonization are very young in terms of, of the, um, uh, the larger look at, at human habit habitation of the planet. So I think it's largely propaganda to believe that uh, we're fallen by nature. I think that serves authoritarian systems that then tell us the only way we can achieve moral behavior is through going through them, all right? Accepting those, those uh, authoritarian systems that supposedly have, you know, the one-on-one the -on -one with God or, or creator. You know, I don't see that uh, 
that attitude happening pre-contact here. Uh, I think where we had in Mesoamerica the rise of the empires, uh, I think that's where people did fall away. I don't think that's a, an inevitability. I think, say, when I look at the Maya, uh, the Mayan, what they call civilization, really was an empire. I don't see that as the civilization because it was only well, maybe three, four hundred years long, which is nothing compared to the amount of time that all those peoples who comprised the Maya had existed in that area, had lived in that area. So you had all these different tribal peoples that had been there for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. And then they had a short period of time where they were an empire, and then they walked away from that empire. Okay, so from our standpoint as an empire civilization, we look at that and say, well, there's that civilization, but we don't really look and study who were all these people before they became that for a short lived period of time and why did they leave that, okay? Uh, here on Turtle Island, there's no evidence of that kind of empire. There were some places where people uh, 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 took over certain areas and things like that. But, you know, the early French maps show that every square inch of Turtle Island was inhabited. Every square inch. There was no vast wilderness, you know, with a few Indians roaming around, bumping into trees and stuff like that. You know, every square inch. You know, if you look at the, the French map, see, all this data is there. This is why education is so important. You know, the French said, well, yeah, every square inch is like accounted for. And so for me to go from here to here, I need a passport. I need a, a message from this leader to that leader there that I'm okay, right? So that I can go through and do my trapping and stuff like that. So conflicts, yeah. Uh, some place more conflict than conflicts than other places. Uh, Native Californians, very little conflict whatsoever. Um, so again, I think it's a lack of evidence to believe that, a lack of looking at the evidence and a lack of really thinking about it. So our educational system uh, is kind of like what uh, Bruce Pascoe, who's a... Uh, uh, Aboriginal scholar in Australia says a lot of the actual data has been purposefully left out because it doesn't fit the colonial narrative. And that's a very recent uh, narrative within, especially if you look at the Aboriginals of Australia and how long people, I mean, they just found a tool for grinding flour 60,000 years old. That's a long time, all right? So how long have the British and the Irish been in Australia? A couple hundred years max, right? And so they are leaving their own sentences written by their own soldiers who first came there who said they're leaving these sentences out. Sentences like, we came across a valley with yams planted as far as the eye could see that were planted so thick we couldn't even walk across the valley. With, and they're saying the same thing. Gerald Clark is a Kumeyaay scholar in Riverside, I believe, says the same thing. Early Spanish soldiers, we came across a valley that was planted with native agriculture as far as you could see, with irrigation, natural irrigation, uh, a herd of deer, a thousand strong, immense numbers of people, all right? So that's all there. We just have to mine it, okay? We also have to mine uh, things like the Santa Cruz mission I mean, by looking at the records, like what a friend of mine is, is doing now in a book about the Santa Cruz mission to see that uh, only 15% of the children born in that mission made it to 15 years old. The rest didn't, they died, right? 
85% of the people went into that mission died. That's a higher attrition rate than Dachau. Yeah? So all the data is there if we have the will to go beneath the colonial narrative. So, again, I think it's, it's a mindset. It's not a reality. And it makes it easy. If you inhabit that mindset, it makes it easy to go along with what's going on. You know, it also creates a nihilism that I think is very damaging to the individual uh, spirit, in a sense, or the individual personality. It's an acceptance of life as far less than what we know it really is, than what our hearts really tell us it really is. It's an acceptance of less than our capacity as human beings. I think that's really a dangerous place. And I think it's rampant. And that creates a dissonance. It creates a dissonance. And people who operate on a daily basis with that cognitive dissonance or that dissonance in values are very easily manipulatable. All right? Because they're not fully in charge of their faculties. Well, they're, they are going to have to go through it, but as they are able to articulate it, they gain tools. And as you can help them articulate it, they can gain tools. And that needs to be a process that happens all the time. I know Rico, uh, Rico is 18, and he deals with this. He's had to deal with being the only Native kid in his high school and hearing a history teacher say, well, the Indians are all gone now, and having to confront that. And it's been a struggle for him, but he's had his aunts and uncles and me and people around him, you know, my students and our friends who study all this to give him the perspective, all right? So he and his other young Native friends are very strong in who they are because they understand the influences of colonization and coloni the colonial narrative on their persons, on their personhood. And that's a growing process. So the sooner that begins, the better. At the mission, for instance, uh, when Rico was in fourth grade, the docent was saying, oh yeah, the Native people all wanted to come here and they were happy campers when they built the mission and so on and so forth. And I could see these three Native girls go inside themselves. And the next year they went over to Indian Canyon, they got a, which is a Native run place uh, over in Hollister, and they got a whole other thing. They got the Native perspective on it all. And they came up to me because I had, I had kind of confronted the docent at the mission gently. They came up to me on the next field trip, and they very proudly said, Stan, we're all lonely. We just wanted to tell you that. And they're like fifth grade, okay? That's where, that's where it can happen. So they stand in pride now, and they're being able to see, okay, this story that's being told is not the true story. So what is the true story? So then they learn to be inquisitive. That's a good thing. They learn to be skeptical, skeptical and inquisitive. That's a good combination. That's what creates an autonomous individual within a, a collective of member beings. It's okay to tell them that the, that the narrative is wrong. It's okay to tell them that, I think, you know, because they know it. And it doesn't have to be told to them in some horrific way, you know, and it has, to, it has to be, it can be told to them in all kinds of different ways, you know, what it means to be connected to the earth and 
the sky and animals and other human beings. And I'm seeing a lot of post-apocalyptic films being made. And I want to reiterate that that we're in an apocalyptic time that started for indigenous people here on Turtle Island 500 years ago, for people here in California about 200 years ago. We're still in first contact, okay? We're not in a post-contact time. And I think this is really important to, to think about because again, we segment time. And in that segmenting, uh, there's a danger of separating ourselves from the importance of what really needs to be looked at. And that is that we're in, we're in an ongoing process. And it's taken a good amount of time for us to get to this point. And if we separate these things, we lose the sense of continuity and we lose the sense of cause and effect. We lose the sense of what has created and what continues to create all of this. The this, this sense of, of continuity that I'm talking about is really a, a, a connectedness across time that may help us to see how deeply we are immersed in a kind of thinking or a kind of perceiving that is in a process of shifting by necessity. I think people are reaching out to indigenous people in a sense, the positive sense of that is they're reaching out to something, to a memory within themselves that I think is very positive. The, the negative aspect of it is, is that they very often are doing it in the same modality by which they've taken the land. Okay. And that's problematical. So there's not the degree of respect that needs to be there. And there's not the degree of self-reflection that needs to be there on a societal level and on a personal level, okay? So in that, there's a deification of Native people, which is an objectification at the same time. So that's why looking at the whole phenomenon without that segmentation makes it I don't know how to put it, but it makes it all about all of us all the time. So there's, a, I think, a deeper kind of responsibility, a deeper obligation being met. Um, we have to understand what constitutes an apocalypse. Okay. And I'm using the word apocalypse like in a movie, kind of in a light way, but it's also not at the same time. Uh, genocide is an apocalyptic action. The denial of that genocide or the erasure of that is an erasure of all of what needs to be examined. So that just continues the apocalyptic process. Hence this obsession, I think, with post-apocalyptic stories right now. Maybe deep inside, we all know we're in that <laughs> at this point, all right? They're, they're all about sacrilege. They're all about desecration. Both of them, they're the same, they're the same thing. You know, I mean, if even if you just look at, at, at the destruction of the buffalo, in that very short period of time. It was done for the purpose of wiping out the Plains tribes, okay? So there you have genocide and ecocide hand in hand. And 
you know, I read an article not too long ago that was looking at measurements of climate during the processes of genocide in certain areas. And it was saying very clearly with data that where that stuff was happening, there were radical changes in climate because of the loss of stewardship of the land by native peoples. So again, that's, that's a place where technology can be used in a good way to look and see, okay, we did this behavior here, here's what it caused in terms of climate. So it's putting climate, ecocide, genocide, deicide, okay? It's putting those things all together. That's what, that's what we used to need to use our minds to. And, and that's, that's in there. We have that capacity to use our minds in that way. That's why these things about, oh, humans are just screwed. That's why these things are so dangerous thoughts to inhabit. They're really, they take away all agency. They take away all responsibility for what's happening. That's not okay. You know, we cannot raise children. In Cherokee have a, the biggest sin, so to speak, that you can do is what they call crossing the children's fire which means getting in the way of doing something that gets in the way of a child's fire for life and belief in life. That's what has been happening. That's, and again, to come back to your question of what students learn from reading Native writers, listening to Native people, they learn the seeds of what's gone wrong, and in that, they can see the seeds of what to do right. You can't have it, you can't obsess only with what's gone wrong without seeing what we need to do right. And you can't only look at what we need to do right without looking at what we've done wrong. You can't, it doesn't work that way. You have to look at the whole picture. That's native science. You have to look at the whole picture and you have to be responsible to that whole picture across time and place. Yeah, and we have that capacity. But the key is we have to believe, we have to believe that we have that capacity. So all those narratives that tell us we don't have that capacity, this is really, really wrong. This is dangerous stuff. What you're saying really uh, strikes some to me and kind of goes back to the earlier question you were asking about people wanting indigenous wisdom. And I think, you, I think what you just said is really spot on and looking at the problematical nature where it is problematical because then we're saying then you have non-native people discarding the non-native view and attempting to take on the native view without realizing that the native view that they're taking on isn't the native view it's not holistic anymore right well this didn't work so i want that well wait a minute but you are all of this right so you have to constantly see all of it. I'm surrounded by people at school that are constantly trying to have their students be woke, right? And the students are being woke, woke, and I'm going, why is that the past tense? It's a progressive verb at best, right? Waking. They go, well, decolonize your mind. Okay, so when do you know your mind is well decolonized? We're dealing with with colonization of our minds 24-7, 24-7, you know, as old as I am and as long as I've been living in my traditions, I have to deal with it every single friggin' day, yeah. you know? Yeah. 
I have to make choices every single day and see the choices that are being made around me and make decisions that are questioning how am I going to relate to the choices that that person's making or that person's making. Well, your observation of your own process, I think, is what what I really am resonating with there. I think that's really crucial. You know, it's like uh, I have a friend who's the head of the STEM program at Cabrillo. He's a great scientist. He's brilliant in engineering. And she was a student in my native lit class about 18 years ago. And she went on to get her degrees and come back to the school and had the program. And I was talking to a group of people in a sustainability council the other day, uh, and I was talking about Bruce Pascoe and the, the aboriginals were doing all this agriculture, not to say that that's more advanced than gatherer hunters, but simply to say they were doing all of it, you know, 50, 60,000 years ago, right? And afterwards, she said, you know, Stan, and I told the story about native Californians doing the same. She said, you know, she said, I, when you were talking and you said that, I realized that I really had to struggle with that because I've been so implanted with the notion of simple people living a simple lifestyle with very small numbers in a huge space where they had all kinds of stuff. And she goes, I had no idea of the sophistication of their cultures. And this, and she said, even though she's read stuff, she said, I had to run up against that science in my mind that I've always perceived as fact because it's what I've been taught since kindergarten on. And this is like the, the thing I get constantly, we always have to go through in class with, with non-native students, more than native, but it's oftentimes with native students too, is dispelling the idea of simple primitive cultures that yes, have a, had a beautiful way of life, but it was a very simple approach to life. Okay, and I'm trying to get at this and go into water. If you look at Dakota society pre-contact, every decision that a woman makes in that society has to do with a ton of relatives, relative beings, as well as literal, you know, blood relatives and non-blood relatives, right? Dealing with the past, dealing with the future. Every single decision you make has to have tremendous accountability and responsibility every single day, okay? That's not a simple life. That's a way more complex life than what we live here today. You know, the individualism is a much more simplistic approach to life. It is based on fear, what I am afraid of or what I can get. And so, you know, it's about me or maybe my ex extended family a little bit, but certainly not to the degree that it was in pre-contact societies, as what we can see, you know, sustainability, what we call sustainability, is not about individuals, right, at all. It's about, again, this universe of member beings and being accountable to them 24-7. That's complexity. We're way more simplistic now than, than we were pre-industrial revolution or pre-colonization. That shows more of the human potential. We can get back to that kind of complexity and we have to, you know? And the science can be used to show us that complexity. That's why, I mean, I recently had a conversation with a guy who's an astrophysicist in Switzerland. And I said, what are you working on these days? He said, you know, cosmic web theory. I said, what's that? He said, everything is connected across space and time. We can measure it, so on and so forth. I said, we've been telling you that for 500 years. He laughed and he goes, yeah, you and like some of the early Greek poets, like Epictetus and stuff. So, you know, there it is, right? So now 
you know, and I'm, I don't know enough about quantum physics, but my students tell me that quantum physics also talks about, you know, time not being linear. And of course, the Mayans saw time as interconnecting spirals. So this whole kind of dun, 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 marching, it's like in one line, it's very political, it's very specific to a culture in a certain time and place that we're in right now. I want the story that connects me across time and space, man. I don't want to be this isolated being screwing up right here, right now. And somebody tell me, well, it's just the way you are, man. You're messed up because you're a human being. I was talking with my buddy and the, my brother in the Chiricahua Apache Nation and about it. I was saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm saying in there that to reach out to indigenous people without looking at the genocide is ironic, or reaching out to indigenous people now to save their butts is ironic uh, at best and is really insulting at worst, and, and it's not going to work uh, without really understanding the necessity to to go in and really see the violations of kinship principles, you know, to really come to understand that. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of a harsh thing to say. Maybe people are going to be put off by that. But then I really thought about it because it is important to listen to indigenous people. It's totally important. But you have to listen to the whole thing, not just what you want. And and as I was talking with my friend about it, I said, no, you know, it may sound harsh, but it's true, and I have to stand to it. I really have to stand to it. Um, you can't come to the wisdom of how to deal with this level of destruction without doing the hard work. You just can't. It's just not going to happen.